Would you take out your life together and find the manuscript portion of Philippians we'll be looking at this morning? If you brought along your uh, manuscript that we handed out a few weeks ago, I encourage you to bring this with you so that you can uh, keep all of your notes on Philippians in one place. If you haven't picked one up, there's one out on the, the, the uh, name tag tables out there as you come in. I invite you to pick one up and, and uh, work through it with us the week before the passage so that you are preparing your hearts for hearing God's word. I'm going to read um, this passage. As, as I do, I'd like you to take your pen and uh, circle key words that jump out at you, words that you think are important for our understanding of this passage, uh, key words or phrases, and then I'm going to ask you to, we're going to have a little time of quiet to work on that together. So let me read, um, let me read this passage of Scripture, uh, Philippians 1, through 30. Whatever happens... As citizens of heaven, live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together with one accord for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Let's take a few moments of quiet. Okay, let's take a moment to hear back from you. Why don't you raise your hand? What is a key word or phrase that you see in the passage? Just raise your hand. Good. Citizen. Citizen. Good. Standing firm. Standing firm. One accord. One accord. Striving, together. Striving together. Jeremy? Without being frightened. Without being frightened. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> meant in a really good way, not like whatever. <laughs> By the way, that word translated, that word whatever, really literally is just the word one thing. It's one. As if he's saying, okay, one thing I'm going to tell you now. It's one thing. So whatever. Okay, what else? Yeah. Worthy. Worthy. Pardon? By God. By God. Okay. Believe on him. A sign. A sign. Um, a signal, a demonstration, a sign. Yeah. You will be saved. You will be saved. You will be saved. Suffer. Suffer. They will be destroyed. They will be destroyed. The same struggle. The same struggle. The same struggle. All right, this is our observation together, and maybe you've already done that this week as you've worked through this manuscript. Now let me uh, share with you some of my thoughts about this passage, building on some of these key words and phrases. Paul begins this by saying, whatever happens, and he's referring back to the passage we looked at last week, where we looked at facing adversity. And Paul uh, identifies three obstacles that to God are not obstacles as much as opportunities to advance the gospel. So one is that he's in chains, the obstacle of chains. And he says that this obstacle of the Roman Empire, that he's in chains, actually has served to advance the gospel. And then secondly, he talks about those, the obstacle of those who are preaching the gospel while he's in prison out of envy or selfish ambition. And yet he says no matter what, Christ is proclaimed. That's not an obstacle. And then he talks about the obstacle of death, and Paul says that whether he lives or dies, his life will bring glory to God. And so he ends uh, the last section in 25 and 26 saying to them, whatever happens to me, whether I live or die, whether I come to see you or I'm not able to, then he says, so whatever happens, whatever happens to me or whatever happens to you. This is, a, this is an important 
message that he wants to give to the Philippians. And the key verb in this passage is to stand firm. It's the point of his gospel, the point of his letter to them. In 26, he says that you will continue, I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. His desire here as partners with the church in Philippi is that they continue in their, uh, in their living out the gospel. That they stand firm because he knows their situation. And uh, their situation means that uh, they may not stand firm and they need to be intentional. This is a friendship letter. Uh, he doesn't go into great theology as he does in the letter to the Romans. This is a friendship letter where in the last passage he shared with them his concerns, the things that are happening in his life. He's in chains and now he's going to talk about their concerns and give them an encouragement to stand firm. So whatever the obstacles, whatever the adversity, whatever happens to Paul, he wants them to stand firm. And he wants them to stand firm as citizens of heaven. This is a, an important phrase altogether, citizens of heaven. He, he calls them to be citizens of heaven because they knew that living in Philippi, they were citizens of Rome. This Philippi was a great city. First uh, founded by uh, Philip of Macedonia, Alexander the Great's father. And he established it there because of, the, the, uh, because of the gold they found in the hills and the great fertile soil of the valley that, that Philippi is uh, situated in. It's also a, a strategic, became a strategic uh, city along this road that connected Asia Minor and therefore the Silk Road of trade to Rome. This is a significant road and a port. And Paul knows that these Philippians are citizens first of Rome. And that's very significant in a city that has been populated by uh, Caesar Augustus with former military veterans. This is a very loyal, patriotic town. And in every public gathering, the, the citizens of Philippi would be asked to pledge their allegiance to Nero, the emperor. And they called Nero Lord and Savior. And to not give their allegiance to Nero uh, meant persecution for them, either socially among their uh, neighbors or, uh, or legally by being thrown into prison. And this was a cause of their persecution, of their suffering. So this is a significant uh, statement that Paul asks them to live as citizens, to stand firm as citizens. And the word he uses for live is walk. In other words, he wants them right where they are, where their feet firmly planted in Philippi, in the Roman Empire, as citizens of Rome, to live as citizens of heaven. He doesn't call them to move out of Philippi and, and create a, a commune where they can live by themselves. He wants them to live as citizens of heaven right here in Philippi. To say you're a citizen of Rome means that your allegiance is to Rome. To say that you are a citizen of heaven means that your allegiance, first and foremost, is heaven. N.T. Wright says that we as believers uh, live at the intersection of heaven and earth. We are the intersection of heaven and earth. We are citizens of heaven who live right here in North County, San Diego, with our fir feet firmly planted in this community and called to live as citizens of heaven whose values and attitudes and beliefs and behaviors look like those of heaven, not just the dominant culture. And I would say that for us, this is as challenging a word as it was to the Philippians, and just as important. As followers of Christ, we're called to live in this community with the values of heaven, to live worthy of the gospel. Josh last week reminded us that the gospel is the message, the good news, that in Jesus Christ, God turns bad into good, death into life. And so Paul then shares with them what it will look like for them to live worthy of the gospel. And we skip down to verse um, 29 and 30. He says, for it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, 
but also to suffer for him. To live as citizens of heaven, worthy of the gospel, means not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. This is a very important message from Paul to the church in Philippi. I uh, shared with you that uh, almost a month now ago, Amy and I had the opportunity to do really a, a once-in-a-lifetime trip to, to Turkey and Greece. And I shared with you that when, when the signs were here, uh, talking about Acts chapter 16, where Paul received his vision sitting in Troas because God had blocked the way for him to go deeper into Asia Minor, to go uh, east into Asia Minor. Here he is stuck in Troas, which is the port city that would take someone from Turkey across the Aegean Sea to Europe. And Paul, who was born in Turkey, uh, who knew Turkey, who had established churches in Turkey, now was faced with a vision from God to step out in faith and go to Macedonia, across from Turkey to modern-day Greece, from Asia to Europe. No one had done it before. Paul had never done it before. He had never taken the good news. He'd never taken the message to Macedonia. He had never gone to Europe before. So here Paul is as a human being. And as we stood there on the, the shore of Turkey, anticipating going across the sea to Macedonia, I thought, you know what? Paul was not just the saint that we see in flowing robes in art. Paul was a human being. A man who had a vision from God to do something he's never done before. And so what does he do? He takes his friends Luke and Silas and Timothy. And he believes God. Because belief is more than just a list of doctrines that we, we believe or we think. Believe means to step out in faith. And so I have to tell you, when we made our way to Philippi, we're on this sailing ship uh, going across the same waters that Paul did. I had to get up early and see the sunrise. I was just, I was, way, I was so excited. I knew we were going to study Philippians this summer, and I, I couldn't wait to, to see the port of, of Kavala, which was ancient Neapolis, and see the hills that Paul would have seen as the Ignatia Road went from uh, Turkey, from Istanbul, to, uh, to uh, Greece, to Rome. Looking back over the port and into the valley, this beautiful, fertile valley where Philippi sat strategically, to walk along this, this road, this marble road that's still there, and picture Paul walking into this great city, this little Rome, trusting God, Walking, taking one step after another with his friends saying, okay, do you see anything yet? Okay, who, who is that person that we're supposed to help? Where are they? Can, can you experience that? Have you, have you ever stepped out in faith in something you've never done before? And waiting for God to be faithful and not sure where it's going to be. And so he walks through Philippi and sees the, the great forum, the, the marketplace, the great marble columns and, uh, and walks through town and he looks for the place of prayer because there's no synagogue in Philippi and he finds this group of people headed up by Lydia and he shares with them the gospel, the good news. And we had the opportunity to share communion around this location where Paul first baptized Lydia the first convert of Europe. Now, we read that in Scripture, but here's what I thought. What would you feel, what would you be experiencing in that moment where you find a person who responds to the gospel and you have the opportunity not only to baptize this person but their whole household? What would you experience? What would you feel? Joy. So here I was. I, another pastor gave the devotional, and I had the opportunity to give the words of institution, and I stood there, and I just cried. Because I had this sense as a man, as a human being, who senses that God is calling us someplace we've never been before. 
and can we believe on him? Meaning, can we trust him to step out in faith? Very significant for me to stand here in this place where Paul trusted God enough to sail across the Aegean Sea to someplace he'd never been before and have Lydia respond and there to form this partnership with this fledgling church, which 10 years later he's writing back to them and he's so concerned about them, he says, I have you in my heart. I long for you. I desire to be with you or to be with Christ. I can't decide between the two. Can you imagine comparing your friends to being in heaven? What kind of depth of relationship? Because he believed on Jesus and followed him where he was calling him to go. He's called us to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Now, it's interesting that as I asked for key words, believe on him came up early and suffer for him came up a lot later. <laughs> but Paul wants them to know that what, he has, what they have seen in him, the same suffering they are experiencing, that part of living a life worthy of the gospel, living as citizens of heaven, is not only to believe on him, but also to suffer him. And I believe in the American church today, and for us personally, we much rather believe on him than suffer for him. Paul says they go hand in hand. Now, we don't live, we don't think we live in a a culture where we suffer because we live as citizens of heaven, but I'd like to challenge that. And I'd like to say that we don't probably suffer enough as much as we ought to, because we don't take the the stands that we ought to in our lives to be different. We blend into our culture. Of course we don't experience suffering. We have to live as citizens of heaven with the values and attitudes and behaviors of heaven. That should be a challenge to us. Why? Because the rest of the world experiences suffering. People suffer for believing on Jesus every day in the world. And in order for us to identify with two-thirds of the world that, that suffer for their faith in Christ, for us to understand as global Christians that our brothers and sisters around the world suffer, but also because there is suffering all around us, because people suffer, and we have a, a, a great way of Hiding our suffering, whether it's present or past. With somebody this weekend who said, I bet you don't know my story. I said, what do you mean? Well, because you only know me now, I bet you don't know my whole story. I said, well, tell me. And she explained her story about her family. I said, I would never would have guessed that. We cannot get too far away from our own experience of suffering. Because we need to hear each other's story. I love Paul saying, you are experiencing the same suffering that I experience. Paul, I take my cue from Paul to share my suffering as well as sharing my faith with you. I want you to know where I struggle and not just where I'm uh, doing well. Paul is not ashamed to let them know that he suffers for his faith in Christ as citizens of heaven. We need to identify with suffering because of the suffering in the world, also because of our understanding of each other's story and our understanding of God's grace at work in us. If we were perfect, Jesus didn't need to die for us. But also because we live in a community that suffers. And if all we believe in is a gospel that is a triumphalist gospel that says, when I become a Christian, there is no more suffering. I don't identify with suffering. Then we take the power out of the gospel and we take away our ability to relate to people all around us who are broken and hurting and need to know that God cares about their hurting and their brokenness and that Christ came for that. We need to be able to embrace our own suffering. Last phrase here I'd like to take a look at. He says, I know that you will stand firm in the one spirit, striving together with one accord for the faith 
of the gospel. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I know that you'll stand firm in one spirit, striving together with one accord for the gospel, for the faith of the gospel. We're going to talk next week, uh, as we look at the first 11 verses of chapter 2, we're going to look at what it means for us to strive together in more detail. But let me just say something about striving together in unity. What Justice said is absolutely true. Community is of utmost importance. We are called as a community to strive together in one spirit, to be unified, to encourage each other, to work together for the advance of the gospel. We're not lone rangers. We're not in this just by ourselves. And Paul demonstrated that to them by uh, his partnership with them, with his partnership with Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy and Epaphroditus. They are in this together. They're not lone rangers. They stand firm together. But here's the really good news about the Philippian church. If we just jump forward about 50 years, one of the great uh, joys was to uh, see what they've recently excavated in Philippi, in ancient Philippi. And that is the mosaic floor of a second century church. Now, Paul was writing to the Philippians sometime in the 60s, right? He had visited them about 49 AD. He was writing to them about the 60s. Sometime in the second century, a church was established in Philippi, a building, not just Lydia's home, but a building in this beautiful mosaic floor. And as you look on the edge of the mosaic floor, you see some Greek writing. As you get closer, and uh, we, we, we poured some water on there, you see the word in Greek for Paul. Paulo. The church stood firm. They did it. Whatever encouragement Paul gave them, they listened. They strove together with one spirit for the gospel. They believed on him and they suffered for him. They lived as citizens of heaven. And as a result, we have a second century church that was established in honor of Paul. But it didn't stop there because later we we see unbelievable ruins of a basilica built a few centuries later. A massive basilica. The church grew. This fledgling house church that Paul established by baptizing Lydia grew. They stood firm. And my question to us is, in five years or ten years or fifty years or a hundred years or a thousand years, what will they say about us? Will they look back to this church to the American church, to the movement of Christ and say they stood firm, they worked together to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. They not only believed on him, but they suffered for him. They lived as citizens of heaven. Will they say that of us? I pray that it would be true. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit who speaks to our hearts even in this moment as we've circled words that have leapt off the page to us. And I believe, God, that they leap off the page for each of us for a reason. And perhaps, God, you're speaking something to us about your word and how you'd want to apply it in our lives. God, I pray for us as a church, as a community of believers, as citizens of heaven, that we would live our lives worthy of the gospel. That not only have we been called to believe on you, but to suffer for you. May we willingly make those choices that may not be popular. May we as adults set an example for our children of of making good decisions that may have consequences. 
that may not lead to popularity, that may not lead to economic gain, that may not lead to social status, but would demonstrate our commitment and our loyalty to you as our Lord and our Savior. God, help us to stand firm together to encourage each other, to set an example for each other, to build each other up, to live in community in such a way that we together stand firm. And more than anything, we pray that your gospel would be advanced because we've stood firm, that your gospel would advance here in North County, San Diego, in America, across the globe, in France, in Africa, in South America, in Asia, in Central America, because we have taken seriously the advancement of your gospel. Thank you for your word, and we pray that your word would sink into our hearts, and then we would live our lives worthy of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.